I do plan to still finish that, um, but as we came back from the, tr the retreat last week, there were some other things on my mind, and a message that I had intended to preach for some time, maybe over the course of the last year I've thought about preaching it, and I just, it never seemed the proper time or place, um, but as we came back, there were a few things that really came to my mind that, um, I don't know, drove me to reconsider this, this topic again. And that's why we're here this morning, and we're going we're gonna to deal with this question. And this question comes from this Old Testament passage that we read in Proverbs 10, verse 7. And it says there, The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. And this text raises a question, or at least it ought to raise a question for each of us, which is, which one of these will we be? Which one of these will you be as an individual? Will we be remembered as the righteous, or will we have a name that rots just like the wicked? Another way that we could ask this, and I've gone back and forth on what to even title this uh, because asking the question is somewhat difficult what I'm trying to get at here but a, a very simple way maybe we could ask it would be what will be your life's biography or maybe even what will be said about us how will we be remembered in the end this is sort of the question that I'm trying to get at this morning that I want to ask us and I, I began to ask myself this question a few years ago. Um, I was just reading through the Bible, and it struck me that as I was going through, I kept finding that there were instances in the Scripture, you're reading through, you hear about these different people and their lives, and you notice that often their lives are summed up in maybe one or two sentences. Everything that they were and did is summed up in these sort of short biographical statements throughout the Bible. You find out, brethren, what somebody is remembered for in one or two sentences. And the reality of this text in Proverbs 10 really comes to bear because there are some people who are remembered as the righteous. You get people like Job, for example, Job 1, 1. It says, that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. So here's a man who's remembered as the righteous. But not everybody is that way. There are, there are some people whose names are left to rot in their abundance of wickedness and foolishness. Eli's sons, for example, first Samuel chapter 2, it says that Eli's sons were worthless men and did not know the Lord. And after reading about, I don't know, 20 of these biographical statements, I began to ask myself, Nick, what would yours say if one of these biographical statements was written about you? What would yours say? What would you be remembered for? Brethren, this is the question I want to pose this morning to each and every one of us. What will be your life's biography? How will you be remembered? But I also want to, I want to ask the question even a bit broader than that. I'm, I'm not only concerned with our individual lives. I am, but that's not all it is. I'm also concerned, brethren, for the remembrance of the church. What will be said about Redeemer Community Church? What will be our biography in the end? So I want to pose this question also. And brethren, this, is, this question is so vital for you and I to grasp because it forces us to consider our lives as a whole. Brethren, your life is not summarized by what you did or who you were for a singular moment in time. 
And the reason this whole thing is even coming up is because we just came back from the church retreat a week ago. And you know what, brethren? Your biography is not summed up in what you did or who you were for one weekend in Utah. That's not the summary of your life. Your biography, your memory is going to concern your entire life lived. And so what's your desire? I, I really love these words of Nehemiah. He, as he closes out the book of Nehemiah, he says this. He says, remember me, O my God, for good. Nehemiah wants to be remembered for good. Or rather, if you go through the book of Nehemiah, you, you find out what he wants is to be remembered for the good that he did for Israel. That's what he wants. And brethren, my hope is the same for all of us. And especially so for our church. And we have a lot of great examples through the scriptures. You go through, you find men and women who are remembered as the righteous. I've, I've decided to entitle this, Memories of the Righteous and Rotting Names of the Wicked. And there's a lot of people throughout the Bible that are remembered as the righteous. And they remain a blessing for the people of God. Can you guys think of any, what might be some you can think of, examples of people who are spoken, remember, remember, think of this sort of short biographical statements of people in the Bible. Can you think of any who are remembered as the righteous? Biographies that are good about individuals. I know some of you do because you gave them to me. So you can name yours first. <laughs> John the Baptist. What is, does anybody know what was said about John the Baptist? Right. Jesus says about John the Baptist in, in John chapter 11, he says, Truly I say to you, among those born of woman, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. That's a pretty good biography, right? What else? Any others that come to your mind? Huh? Zachariah and, and Elizabeth. What is said about them? Godly, righteous, upright, fearing the Lord, right? Good. Yes. Others? I have some. How about Apollos? Anybody remember what was written about Apollos in Acts? Acts 18. It says he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures and fervent in spirit. It's a pretty good. It's a pretty good sum up of who this man is. How about Moses? Anybody you know of a very Interesting one sentence summary of Moses. He was more yeah. Numbers 12. Now, the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. Very interesting biography. How about Daniel? Daniel's another good example. Think of this Daniel chapter 6. Daniel's in Babylon, and it says here, the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. That's a good biography. But... Brethren, as you know well, not every person in the Bible is described in a positive light. How about some negative examples? Any negative ones that you can think of? There's a lot of them. Judas. I was going to write him down, but I figured somebody would, somebody would probably uh, guess him. And you know what? Uh, Jim, out at the church retreat, mentioned something about Judas, how he is constantly portrayed in the Bible. What does it always say? the one who was going to betray the Lord. That is this man's biography. Judas, the one who was going to betray the Lord. That's who he is. Any others? Ananias, Anani Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to use them as well. The, the, it's somewhat hard. When you're, when, you're, when you're trying to 
produce a sermon with a certain idea, you kind of have to weed through a lot of different stuff, right? But Ananias and Sapphira are remembered for their lying. They're lying to the church. Any others? Jeroboam. Jeroboam? Yeah, I mean, what, 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 what would you say about Jeroboam? Yeah, yeah. Jeroboam becomes this sort of like pillar of what is wickedness. When the kings of Israel do as their father Jeroboam did, that means they were really wicked people, right? Ahab, another evil king over Israel, it says, Ahab the son of Omri began to reign over Israel, and Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of Yahweh, more than all who were before him. That is an awful biography. How about this man, Diotrephes? Anybody know who he is? Diotrephes. He shows up in 3 John, a little letter at the end of your New Testament. Listen to what is spoken of about Diotrephes. I have written something to the church. This is John writing the letter of 3 John. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. He refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Here is a man who exalts himself and how about this one? As I, again, want to consider not just the individual question, but the church, the congregation as a whole. There are often times uh, where things are spoken positively about a whole people group in the Bible, and oftentimes when something negative is spoken about a people in general. And this verse has always struck me. Paul writes, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, you don't have to go there. I'm going to have you go to a lot of these passages later, but right now we're just summarizing things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes, and he is speaking about the Jews, particularly the Jewish leaders and the Jews who rejected their Messiah, who rejected Christ. And he says this, for you brothers... These, this is the, the Thessalonians, the Christians. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. And now he's going to go on and summarize these people. The Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. These, Paul writes, these are people who oppose all of mankind because they hinder the message of salvation. And brethren, this is what is written about these people. It is written for eternity. God wrote it in his book. This is what these people are remembered for. Whether good or bad, these are their biographies. And there's countless ones scattered throughout the Bible. And I want to use these biographical statements as sort of a guide for us this morning. I want to consider the memory of different people throughout the Bible and ask ourselves this question, what would be written about me? And I have seven, seven comparisons for us to consider and each of these shows sort of a biography on either side of the aisle. We get, a, we get a negative look of somebody whose name is left to rot. And a positive look of somebody whose name is remembered as the righteous. But the last one is, again, going to be this question of the church. A little bit broader than just the individual. So I have seven of these. Now, these seven will be short. They're, they're going to, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. This morning I was getting ready to preach and my hunter goes, are you preaching today? And I said, yeah. And he says, you preach long. So, so I'm really intent on this not being long. Um, 
uh, but I have, I have seven here I want to look at. And I've, I've, in, I've purposefully titled each of these in a way that I want them to be memorable to you. I want them to stick in your brain as ways to think about how your biography will be summarized. So our first comparison is this. Will we be devoted disciples or diverted by idols? Devoted disciples or diverted by idols? And brethren, this comparison is is pretty self-explanatory. Will we be remembered as those who were devoted disciples of the Lord, or will we be remembered as people who maybe once were devoted, but eventually became diverted by any number of idols? And when you think of devoted disciples, you could think of any number of people in the Bible. But again, I'm, I'm wanting us to focus here on short statements made in summary of somebody's life and what these people are remembered for. And so my first example is a man named Hananiah. Probably nobody in here is familiar with Hananiah. And uh, we're going to look at his life. And I can tell you for sure that this man's reputation was not in question. I want you to go to Nehemiah chapter 7. Nehemiah chapter 7. You have first and second Chronicles, and then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 2. You have a, basically what's playing out in this situation is Israel has returned now from Babylon. And they're rebuilding Jerusalem, they're rebuilding the wall And as the wall is rebuilt in Jerusalem, Nehemiah is now putting leaders in place in their proper positions. And here's what is written about this man, Hananiah. Nehemiah 7, verse 2. Nehemiah says, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem... For he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. What a way to be remembered. I, I wanted to start with this one because I'm not sure you could ask for a better biography to be left of you than to be a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. But there's plenty of others in the Bible. How about what is said of Caleb in Joshua chapter 14. Here, Joshua summarizes the the biography of Caleb. Joshua 14, verse 14. It says, Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed Yahweh, the God of Israel. Or how about a man, Epaphroditus? This is a a man Paul speaks of in the New Testament, in the book of Philippians. He says about this man, Epaphroditus, that to honor such men... For he nearly died for the work of Christ. Brethren, these are devoted men, devoted disciples, so to speak. Individuals who are remembered as the righteous because they were faithful, God-fearing, wholehearted servants of the Lord. But, of course, on the other hand, we have people whose biography reads quite differently. People like Amaziah. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 25. 2 Chronicles 25.
Look with me at verses 1 and 2. Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoiada of Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of Yahweh, yet not with his whole heart. Here's a man who seemed faithful to the Lord for a time. But eventually, he was led into idolatry, into the worship of other nations' gods. This man was not a Joshua who was wholly following the Lord. And of course, you get the example of Solomon. Go over to 1 Kings 1 Kings chapter 11. And here is what's spoken of him. 1 Kings 11 verse 4. When Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to Yahweh his God as was the heart of David, his father. Brethren, these, these are hard to read at times. His heart was not wholly true. And so again, this question is, how will yours read? Will we be remembered as devoted disciples or as those who were eventually diverted by idols. The second comparison is somewhat of a similar nature, but with a bit of a, a twist on it. And I've titled this second one, Becoming Forgetful or Remaining Faithful. Becoming Forgetful or Remaining Faithful. And the idea comes from what is found in Deuteronomy chapter 8. 11 through 20. Now, I don't have time to read that whole section, but essentially what is happening there is Moses is warning the Israelites as they are about to enter into the promised land, and he's warning the people to take heed that they don't forget their God. He warns them that as they enter into that promised land, they're going to experience a lot of blessings. God is going to bless them with houses that they didn't build, land that they didn't work on, crops that they didn't plant. And he warns them not to become proud and forget their God who gave them everything that they had. And you know, brethren, there's a fair amount of individuals in the Bible who failed deeply in this regard. They grew older and they grew more and more forgetful of their God. And I want you to take, for example, Rehoboam. Giovanni had brought up Jeroboam and his wicked testimony. But Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, go to 2 Chronicles. And let's see what's said of him. 2 Chronicles chapter 12. It says, when the rule of Rehoboam was established and he was strong, he abandoned the law of Yahweh and all Israel with him. So here you have this man. This is the grandson of David. And yet as he grows older and he grows more powerful, we see him come to forget his God and all that this God had done for him and for his family. Another example which follows a similar pattern is Uzziah. We're not going to go to that text right now, but in U about Uzziah's life in 2 Chronicles 26, it says that when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. And this was a man who was 
a faithful king for some time. If you read the biography, the, the, the life sort of, of Uzziah, it actually says just a little bit earlier in his story that for as long as he sought Yahweh, God made him prosper. And this is a man who was seeking the Lord and he prospered. And then as he grew older and he grew more proud, he forgot his God. He grows proud, he forgets his God, and he thinks he has the right to do whatever he wants to do. And he didn't remain faithful. And his story is forever shaped that way. It can't be undone. But then we, we find others who remain faithful, who do not forget their God. And there's a handful of these in the Bible. Josiah, 2 Kings. 2 Kings 22. 2 Kings 22, it begins, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida, and the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. And he did what was right in the eyes of Yahweh and walked in all the way of David his father and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. It goes on later in chapter 23, verse 25, and says this, Before him there was no king like him who turned to Yahweh with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Here's this man who faithful to the Lord and he does not turn to the right or to the left. He remains faithful. Another great example, a man named Antipas. Anybody know who that is? He comes to us in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. Jesus is commending this church in Pergamum. And he says this in Revelation 2, 13. He says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Here's this man who, faithful to the end, faithful literally to death. And brethren, you want to be among those who hold fast to the end. You want to be among those who remain faithful. You don't want to be remembered as one who grew forgetful of their God, who grew fat from blessing. And departed from following God. Brother, you want to be an Antipas. You don't want to be Uzziah. The next comparison. Probably the most stark comparison that we're going to make today. I've titled it, Greatly Missed or Happily Dismissed. Greatly Missed or Happily Dismissed. Brethren, there's people in the Bible that when they die, they are greatly missed. And you can consider this example in Acts chapter 9. A woman named Tabitha. Acts 9. Look with me starting in verse 36. It says, Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. Now later on in the story, we find out that this woman has died and Peter has gone up to where she lives. And so if you go to verse 39, you'll notice it says here, so Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All, now notice what it says here. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. 
This woman is deeply missed by these other disciples. People grieve for her. And not only because she was beloved, but because she was also very useful. This woman was a servant to the saints, a valuable one. And brethren, when people like that go, they're greatly missed. They are remembered as the righteous. But there are people on the other hand, that when they die, they are not greatly missed. But rather, they are happily dismissed. And one of these examples is about an individual named Jehoram. Go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 21. This man was a king of Judah. And in 2 Chronicles 21, 20, it says this. He was 32 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he departed with no one's regret. They buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. Brethren, that is a horrid biography. That is a name that is left to rot with the wicked. But potentially, even worse yet, is what is said of Athaliah. She's a wicked woman who sought to kill her bloodline so that she could take the kingdom for herself. Go to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 11. Second Kings 11 verse 16. It says... They laid hands on her, and she went through the horse's entrance to the king's house, and there she was put to death. But go down to verse 20, and here's what it says. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet after Athaliah had been put to death with the sword at the king's house. Brethren, not only is this woman not greatly missed, she is so happily dismissed that people rejoice at the fact that she is no longer alive. And brethren, I'm sure that there is no worse way to be remembered. There is no worse biography, no worse summary to be written of a person's life other than they departed with no one's regret, or they rejoiced at his or her death. Brethren, these are horrid biographies. And may we be like Nehemiah, that we would plead with God that we would not be remembered this way, but be remembered for good, that we might be like this this woman, Tabitha, who was greatly missed by the saints. Another comparison. I've titled this one, A Useful Assessment or a Wasted Investment. A Useful Assessment or a Wasted Investment. And the intent behind the language is is simple, brethren. There are some people presented in the Bible and they are given an assessment of usefulness. Very useful and valuable to the kingdom of God. And consider what's spoken about Timothy. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verses 19 through 22. Here Paul writes. He's writing to the church of Philippi, and he says, 
I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. Well, how about that biography? Paul writes about this man. And, and it's not so flattering in regards to the other people about whom Paul writes <laughs> when he says, I have no one else like Timothy. Everybody else is concerned about their own welfare. But it is very, it is a glorious way for Timothy to be remembered. He is unique amongst the co-workers of Paul. There's no one like him in Paul's mind who serves the church in the same way. And you remember, brethren, this is how Timothy's, this is Timothy's biography from the start. When Paul first meets him in Acts chapter 16, it says that he was well spoken of by the brothers. And this biography of Timothy follows him through his whole life. And then, on the other hand, there are others who, though granted so much from God, ended up, being essentially a wasted investment on God's part. And we've talked about these words before. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. I've spoken on this in the past. But these are some surprising words spoken about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was and is portrayed in the Bible for most of his story as a righteous king. But these are, some, these are some surprising words spoken at the end of his life. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 25. It says that Hezekiah did not make return according to the benefit done to him, for his heart was proud. Now, here's this man who, near the end of his life, he prays. And he asks God for 15 more years of life. And God answers him. And God grants him that very request. God gives him 15 more years. The Lord had made an investment in the bank of Hezekiah, so to speak. And what is the Lord's return? Nothing. The Lord makes no return on that investment. Hezekiah made no return according to the benefit done to him. He does not have a biography of usefulness, but rather one of a wasted investment. Brethren, this is not what we want our memory to be. Rather, my hope is that we can all speak in the end just as Paul does. He, he writes in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Those are powerful words, brethren. Those are powerful words. Paul was determined to not be a wasted investment. He was determined that the grace of God towards him was not going to be in vain. And we ought to live our lives in the same way. That the grace of God and the investment, right, all that the Lord had done for us, rather than how Hezekiah's biography reads, that we made no return on all that the Lord had done to us, but rather as Paul's reads, that all that the Lord had done for me was not in vain. Now, our next one. I want to give you a case study of two individuals. One of them is, of course, a warning. But the other is really an encouragement to you that these biographies, at least the ones of our own life, now the ones that are written here in the Bible, they're written. They can't be changed. But the ones that are being written of our own lives, they're not done yet. Your story, your biography is not done being written yet. There are still chapters to be finished. 
And so I've titled this one, A Fallen Position and a Man Rewritten. A Fallen Position and a Man Rewritten. Now there's actually... I have, a, I have a set of two people that I want to consider. There's another set of two people that could well be considered under this category as well. But the man I want to consider with a fallen position is a man by the name of Demas. Maybe you're not familiar with him, but he was a, he was a co-worker with Paul. He was a missionary, worked with Paul, traveled with Paul, preached with Paul. And he is spoken well of, spoken fondly of in two different places in the Bible. You don't need to turn to these, but Colossians 4.14, Paul says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. So here's this man. He's with Paul. And as Paul writes this letter to the Colossians, he's there laboring with him and he greets this church. And then again, in Philemon, Verse 23 and 24, Paul says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So he's there amongst these men, amongst the chiefs. They're out and they're ministering and they're preaching and they're traveling. He's a co-worker of Paul. He holds a wonderful position and undoubtedly he accomplished a lot as he labored alongside these other saints. But then later in Paul's life, we find out an awful truth concerning this man, that he has fallen from his position. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter Four about Demas. He says, as he writes to Timothy, he is asking for Timothy to come visit him. And he says in 2 Timothy 4, 9 and 10, Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Brethren, this is a heartbreaking story. And you ha you're left asking, what happened to this man? I mean, we're, not, we're not told how it all took place. But this man has fallen. And I just think of those words. I think it's, when Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle and the messenger comes back. And you know what David says when, when the messenger comes back and, and tells him that Saul and Jonathan had died in battle? You know what he says? I figured you might know what he says. He says, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Brethren, this is what we see happening at times in the Bible. How the mighty have fallen. Demas. His biography is merely of a man with a fallen position. But brethren, there is hope. There is hope and encouragement because there is another man in the Bible who seems to have a very similar story being written about him, but eventually this man's biography is rewritten. And his name is Mark. And he's spoken of in a few different places in the Bible. And his story begins in the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 12. Mark. And in Acts 12... Verse 25, we find out that Paul and Barnabas are coming back from Jerusalem and they have sort of in their toe with them a man named Mark. 
It says that Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. So now this man, he joins among the ranks of Paul and Barnabas, probably even knew Demas. And then it says later on, chapter 13, that Paul and Barnabas are about to head out on their first missionary journey. And in chapter 5, it says this, as they, they leave and they go out, and it says in 13.5, when they arrived in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. So here's this man, John Mark. He's with Paul and Barnabas, laboring, preaching with them, serving with them in the ministry. And all seems well until we get to verse 13. And in 13, chapter 13, verse 13, we find out this. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know the reason of this man's departure, but we can be pretty sure that it wasn't good. And the reason is because later on in Acts 15, there is a dispute that takes place concerning Mark. Uh, Paul is about to head out again on another missionary journey, and Paul refuses to take this man. And he refuses to take this man with him because he doesn't trust him to be reliable. Look at what is said in Acts 15, 37 and 38. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. So here's this same individual again. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had drawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Now, this man's story seems set. He seems to be heading down the same road as Demas. He had abandoned his brethren at some point in the ministry, and he's known for that. Paul doesn't want to take him again. Paul doesn't believe this man to be reliable. And this was not shaping up to be a memory of the righteous. The brethren, this man's story wasn't done. And Something happens. Something happens with this man that, that we, we, we don't know what it is that happened, but something happened to him. And later on, his biography gets another chapter added. And it's a chapter that reshapes his entire life. And near the end of Paul's life, he writes about Mark again in 2 Timothy Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Paul says, Luke alone is with me. And then he says this, Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. I read that and I just think, wow. I mean, it, that, that's the kind of thing that, that we need to hear on a regular basis. Brethren, this man's biography reads entirely different because of what took place in his life at some later point. Yes, there are failures. Yes, you read his full-length biography and you find a man who at a point had a failure, at a point abandoned his brethren, at a point was known as someone not very reliable. But the summary of his biography is one who is very useful for ministry. And that is an encouraging reality, brethren. He goes down as a memory of the righteous. This is a man who was rewritten. The next comparison, this is number six, 
I, could, I had six, and I thought, I can't end on six. That's right. Got to have seven. That's right. So we got two more. They're quick. Next comparison. I've titled it, A Blessing in Church or a Troublesome Curse. Again, this is going to have similarities to some of the others, but there are elements to each of these that are a bit different and I think important to bring out. So, a blessing in church. Brethren, there are people spoken of throughout the scriptures who have proven themselves to be blessings to others in the congregation. They've proven themselves useful. They've proven themselves practical. They are not leeches who are there to suck life out, but they are refreshing fountains to inject life in. And there's an example here in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul speaks of a man, Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus. And he says this in 2 Timothy 1 verse 16. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. This is an encouraging biography of this man. What a blessed man this was. And brethren, to be men and women like this. Men and women who are blessings to others in the church and a refreshment to the saints. But on the other hand, there are those who are a troublesome curse, a troublesome curse upon the congregation. And there can be no greater example than the man whose very name became a proverb and a saying for this very thing. And this man's name is Achan. And his story is laid out in Joshua chapter 7, and maybe you're familiar with it, but Israel is going in to conquer Jericho and Achan steals some of these forbidden items of Jericho and he keeps them for himself. And this brings destruction upon Israel because of Achan's sin. And you know what this man's name means? One of you two will know. <laughs> yeah. It, his name literally means one who brings trouble. And that's exactly what he did, brethren. And in 1 Chronicles, this man is defined by his troublemaking. It says in 1 Chronicles 2.7, Achan, the troubler of Israel. It's actually a play on his name. Achan, the troubler of Israel, who broke faith in the matter of the devoted things. And brethren, this man was such a troublesome curse to the congregation that literally from Jericho onward, his name became a byword to all who came after him. Later on, you, you, you find that language being used. I'm blanking on who it was. Uh, maybe Ahab. Yeah, Ahab. Elijah is called upon by Ahab, and Ahab says to Elijah, he calls him an Achan. He says, you are a troubler of Israel. Achan's name is beginning to be used as a saying for an individual who is a curse upon the people. And brethren, it has been that way ever since. Achan becomes a warning to everyone who comes after, to beware, lest you be the Achan in the camp, to be mindful that you are not remembered as one who brings trouble upon the congregation, but rather to be remembered as one who brings blessing. Now our final one, final comparison, and again, as I said, I want this one to be concerning the church as a whole not just individuals. 
What will be the biography of Redeemer Community Church? I've titled this one. This one was hard to title, but this is what we have. A Church Shining Bright or the Dimming of Light. A Church Shining Bright or the Dimming of Light. And first, we have this church that shines brightly. Go to 1 Thessalonians. Paul writes two letters to this church. And in his first letter, he says some very encouraging things about this church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look with me at, starting in verse 2. He says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Brethren, this church is a city on a hill, as Jesus says, a lamp that cannot be hidden. This church is a busy church. Verse 3, he says, we remember your work of faith and your labor of love. This church is a Bible-believing and Bible-loving church. He says in verse 6, You receive the word in much affliction. This church is an evangelistic church. He says that not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. These people have proclaimed the gospel everywhere. This church is a repentant church. He says in verse 9, You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Brethren, this is a glorious biography of a church. It is. And the question is, again, is this who we are? Is this who we will be remembered as? Because what's on the other end? The other end are churches in the Bible who are not shining brightly, but rather they are, their light is dimming. And we could use a lot of different examples, but we will use exa this example of the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. This is a church which has many good qualities, things that are commendable by the Lord, but they lack the most important. And he says this in Revelation 2.4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. And here comes the, here comes the warning. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. From its place unless you repent. I find it interesting that people have debated and discussed what the first love is uh, stated here in Ephesians or in, in Revelation, and nobody knows for certain what is it that this church lost. We don't know for sure, but we know this that if they don't get it back, Jesus is going to come and take their lampstand take their light and put it out. We know that for sure. Whatever it is that they had at once, they don't have any more. If they don't get it again, 
Jesus is going to remove their testimony. Jesus is going to remove their lamp. He's going to remove their light. Brethren, this is a warning to all churches, and ours included. Our church is still quite young, brethren, but we've now existed for four years, which means that you can talk about what we were over here and what we are over here. It's not short enough where none of that exists. It's not, it's not super old, but it's not, it's not young enough where there's not gaps, right? And brethren, the question that needs to regularly be asked is, are we what we were here? We could be, we may not be what we were here in the beginning. We may be better. That's possible. We may be the same, or we may be worse. And there has to be an evaluation always of all churches of whether or not we have abandoned whatever it was that we had at first. And brethren, we have got to maintain the path that the Lord set us on in the beginning. We have got to keep the love we had at first, whether that is love for the Lord, love for one another, love for the cause of Christ, love for the kingdom, love for service, love for evangelism, love for prayer, whatever it is, brethren, those things are the things that have to continue to shape the church or the warning stands. If you don't do the works you did at first, I will take your lampstand. You won't have it anymore. And brethren, we have to maintain the path we were set on from the start. We have to maintain the zeal we had at the start. We have to maintain the evangelistic heart we had at the start. Brethren, it was so encouraging to go out to Smith's again and to be evangelizing out there. I mean, we went out there and we were, we were overrun. We ran out of Bibles. Talking to people is such an encouraging time. And I asked myself, what in the world have we been doing? I mean, we've been doing whatever we've been doing, but we should have been doing that is what we should have been doing. Well, then the life of evangelism that we had, the burden for prayer that we, have, that we had at the beginning. I mean, we've maintained a prayer meeting since the start. But brethren, I have to ask the question of whether or not the heart is the same as it always has been. In fact, brethren, I, and I, I share this with you as, I guess in some way rebuke, but, but, but more so a desire, brethren, to have us ask this question. But uh, Jill is Jim's wife, right? Jill was speaking with my wife uh, at, the con, at the retreat, and she was telling her that she wanted to share something at the end of one of Jim's messages. But she said something to my wife to the effect of, but I didn't know if it would be acceptable because it doesn't seem like the women pray. Brethren, that, that cannot be the testimony of our church. That cannot be. Now, I know that there is not complete truth in regards to that statement. I know that women in this church do pray. However, if somebody can be at our church, and not just for five minutes, but be at our church over the course of, what was that, four days or so? And their interpretation of who we are is that the women don't pray? Brethren, that is not a good testimony. That is not a good biography written of Redeemer Community Church. It's just not. And so, brethren, the question again of, of what we are, what we were at the start, what is written about us, does the heart remain the same? We must hold on, brethren, to the love we had at first. Or, or what will our legacy be? Brethren, God forbid that Redeemer Community Church's name would rot. But may it be remembered 
for good. So we have these seven comparisons. Will we be devoted disciples or diverted by idols? Will we become forgetful or will we remain faithful? Will we be greatly missed or happily dismissed? Will we be among those who have a useful assessment or one who was a wasted investment? Will we be those who have a fallen position? Or maybe some of you can have your biography rewritten. Will we be a blessing in the church or a troublesome curse? And will our church be shining bright? Or will it be the dimming of light? And these are the, these are the questions, brethren, we have to ask ourselves. What will be written of us? Let's pray.